What is up, everybody? Welcome to the live composing show. This is Stephen Malin here at Video Game Music Alliance, and I hope that you're having a fabulous Thursday. I'm really pumped about today because we're going to be solving two things at the same time. Number one, every single month inside of our pro group, we have what is called a VGM challenge. And essentially, it is a very specific composition, production, technology, and business challenge that uniquely targets each of our three distinct lanes within VGMA. So essentially what that means is everybody inside of our group is at a different skill level, a different experience level, different part in their journey as a composer. And so what we do is we cater to exactly where you're at and we come up with a challenge every single month that uniquely allows each composer to take that next step in their career. And so for this month, we have a very special challenge. The folks over at Royal Monkey, this is a game dev team who has uh, been working on a game called Avian. And I'm really excited about this because, let me pop over here. I'm excited about this because Avian is an indie game. So it's a small team of, of developers and they have very kindly provided us with a documentation that kind of walks through some of the art, some of the, the music direction and all that kind of thing. And they've given us some gameplay. They've actually given us the game to play. Um, and obviously within the game, you can actually toggle, you know, the music level, the sound effect level. And that way, if you want to capture your own footage, you can. And what we're doing is we have a challenge where um, for our Kickstarter lane, folks, they're going to be creating a loopable track of ambient music between one and two minutes, and it's going to be based on the visuals. And then those members are going to export that track as a 24-bit 48K WAV file, which is pretty standard practice. So that's um, our Kickstarters. Those are our beginners uh, for video game music. And then for our Launchpad and Accelerator members, they'll be doing the same challenge where they're going to be creating a loopable track, one to two minutes of ambient music for the game, and exporting their track as you know their stereo out master file as 24-bit 48K WAV. But they have an additional challenge where they're also going to be exporting stem layers. And each of those will be a WAV file. And so what I want to do here today is I'm going to do my own personal take on how I would approach this challenge of how I would, from a fresh session, take some gameplay footage, write some ambient music to the game, and export these files. And I'm going to take the Launchpad Accelerator challenge of also creating layers and stems. That way you guys know exactly step-by-step -step how to go through this process and you can export those files and deliver them. And so what we're doing next week, so mark your calendars for, I'm sorry, two weeks from now, not one week, two weeks from today, we're going to be doing a, a listening party for all of the participants inside VGMA Pro. And we're going to be actually listening to their tracks and maybe even stacking it against the gameplay to see how it fits. And we're gonna be critiquing, you know, did this work, did it not work? Here's some suggestions and we'll be walking through that together as a group. And all of you are invited, and that will be live here on YouTube, just like always. Um, so, man, if you're not already inside the VGMA Pro group, there's no better time than right now. Uh, we actually launch again next month, just giving you a heads up. So if you are on the wait list right there, boom, there's a link, uh, videogamemusicalliance.com. You can join the wait list today. And the wait list is the only place that you get to find out when we open again and the direct links to make that happen. That is very intentional. It's a very exclusive group on purpose because we're a relatively small group. We're about 65 members right now and we're only growing and we're doing this very strategically to where we grow in little chunks. That way we can onboard everybody at once, get them all assimilated into the group, into the culture, into the lane system. And obviously we have tons of content there with courses and master classes and a ton of amazing A-list guests this year. I think I recently counted, we have a, like a dozen guests this year. It's pretty wild, honestly. Um, all, of the, all the talent and all the conversations we get to have this year. So um, if there ever was a time to join, this is the time. So come check that out. And as a bonus, you get a free guide. It's a three-page guide uh, we put together, which answers the top 25 questions that every video game composer wants to know. It has to do with you know, how do I make a living doing this? How do I work on composition and production and technology and business and all that stuff? So check that out. 
The link is in the live chat right now, or you can click in the description or just type in videogamemusicalalliance.com if you're listening. So I hope that is a huge blessing to you guys. So let's jump in. This is going to be a shorter stream today because typically with ambient music, it's just a quicker composition process because there's less involved. But I want to give a brief outline of the way that I approach ambient music. It doesn't mean it's the law and it doesn't mean it's the only way to approach ambient music. It just means I've done a lot of it. And here are some general best practices that I've discovered that will be very helpful for you. So my approach is when I'm inside my Cubase session, not that you have to use Cubase, but you can use whatever DAW you'd like. I like to import my gameplay clip. And if you don't already have a gameplay clip, what you can do, you can use some free software. I personally use Streamlabs OBS, and that is a free streaming software. It's what I'm using right now to stream here on YouTube. Uh, but it's also a recording software. So you can actually set it up to where you can uh, quickly grab a screen and record this screen. So this is how I grab a lot of my clips from for gameplay. Is I'll open up some gameplay for a game and then hit record and, and there we go. We, we now have a little gameplay clip and you can import that directly as an MP4 into your Cubase or other DAW session. Or if you have the game, in this case I had the game and all the members that are doing the challenge will have access to the game next week. Um, you can just go inside the game open it up and go into your options like in most modern games and you can go to your you know sound settings and you can you can take the music off completely and now you have a gameplay clip of your character walking around um, and you can use your keyboard or if you have an xbox controller like me you can just plug it up to your your pc i think max can do it too i'm not sure but you can walk around and you know play the game so uh i'll also be providing the gameplay clip that i'm using today uh, if you want to specifically use that, because maybe you're not able to open up the uh, the game if you don't have a Windows computer, so it is what it is. But anyway, uh, once you have a gameplay clip, what I like to do is there's really two steps, two things that I think you should definitely consider before you ever write a note of music, and that is the tempo, so how fast is your music going to be, and number two, it's the instrumentation. What types of sounds are you going to use? Because this is going to completely change the direction of how you approach your music. So in this case, let's take a moment. I think it's worth it. Let's watch the gameplay clip that I grabbed so you can get a general sense of what this game is all about. Um, it's like a 3D exploration game. And then we'll, we'll dive into just some observations. So what I would love to know is as you guys are watching this over the next minute and a half, I would love in the live chat, if you take a minute, write down just one or two observations about the world, about maybe the color scheme, about maybe the sound design, or even the gameplay itself. What kind of music do you feel just innately would really vibe well with this world? So let's do that, and then we'll come back. All right, so I typed this in the live chat, and it seems like most of you agree 
that I just get very strong Journey vibes. So the Austin Winery soundtrack, uh, that game from that game company, uh, many years ago now, about a decade ago or so, um, that that game came out for PS3. Um, but what I've always loved about that style of game is it's an exploration type game. And you can say the same thing for Flow, which is a previous game that they did, um, or even Flower. Um, it's, it's an exploration, or Abzu, which is a more recent one. They're exploration games where part of the experience is just kind of exploring and enjoying the world. And I just think it's really cool. It's a very sweet um, kind of artistic experience, just kind of walking through this world. So some of the things that you guys said in the, in the live chat um, that really stick out. Um, Arfo said, I instantly hear mystical, magic, jungle-ish type music. Very calm. Um, one of the kind of musical suggestions that we have. Uh, Danny H says, definitely gives me adventure journey through the woods vibe. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of game references that you guys mentioned. Um, Clinton says, dark visuals inside a cave environment, which perhaps would be dark sounding music to go with it. Uh, Sector 7 likes the contrast of the bright neon colors against the background. So there's a very specific artistic aesthetic here. Uh, Micah thinks uh, a vibraphone line would work well here. Uh, and Antonin says lots of flute sounding sounds. Yes, Treetop Ghost. PS3 was over a decade ago. Isn't that weird? We're all getting old. Uh, Eugene says, nature vibes, light movement of character, ethnic culture vibes. Don't use a lot of woodwinds as they are sound design based on that. Ethan says, something kind of magical sounding would be good. Maybe like some rare woodwinds or harp or celeste. Great suggestion, guys. So I hope that, that those of you who are inside the pro group will do those things. You'll, you'll lean into your gut because I can't possibly hit all of those things. And some of those are actually conflicting ideas. Um, uh, and even Ethan said, Am and ambient kind of stuff like strings or pads, right? There's just so many things you could do to help get the vibe. So what I was looking for and what I'm, I'm prompting you to do, and this is what I do sometimes, is I'll get out a, a sticky note. I by the way, if you don't have sticky notes, what are you doing with your life? Um, I, have <laughs> I have like four stacks of sticky notes um, at all times. And whenever I have an idea, I just, you know, I jot it down. Uh, but when it comes to, to writing music, it's important that before you ever write a note, you have a very clear sense of direction that you're going for. And one of the challenges with writing music for a game that already has sound design is it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's good that we already have sound design because now we know exactly how the music should fit inside the game, but it also creates an extreme challenge because now we have to dodge certain pitches. Or in this case, the... Uh, the, the character actually has a flute that they're constantly playing to control the world. So the entire world it operates based on playing different notes, which are the shorter buttons on the Xbox or the PS controller. And those are the different pitches, the different colors that, that kind of move the world around. So it's going to be essential that I choose a key, a music key, or, or some kind of ambient um, soundscape that doesn't clash with that, but instead complements it. So my gut reaction is we have a, a extreme contrast of light and dark, and we also have some ethnic vibes. So for me, I think it's important that we choose, going back to the very first thing we talked about, we need to choose a tempo that makes sense. And because it's ambient, and because the team is specifically asking for ambient music, it doesn't mean it has to be just drones. It just means it, it needs to complement the world. So it needs to be a slower tempo. That is a given. It can't be 120 BPM plus. It really needs to be slower, like 60 or, or 70 BPM. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Um, let's go to make sure I have my buttons. There we go. By the way, I updated Cubase. If you didn't hear that from last week, the stream was an absolute nightmare because uh, my Cubase 12 in the middle of the stream decided to update I don't even know how that happened. It was just an automatic update and it screwed everything up. All of my preferences were wiped. It went back to default. It was just a nightmare and my computer just felt like it was blowing up. Um, so I got, the, I got all that fixed and actually upgraded to the next Cubase Pro, which is 12, and now everything works perfectly. So 
whatever. <laughs> that is what it is. Um, anyway, when it comes to tempo, let's do 70 just to kind of have a starting point. And then we have to start talking about instrumentation. Now, there's a lot of things I could do with instrumentation, but the categories of stems or layers that I plan to create and deliver for the game, I would like to have, and I'll even type these out um, just so we can all see it. So ambience would be the first one, melody would be the second one, a bass would be the third, and then percussion would be a fourth. These are not, these are not like the end all be all categories, but in general, when you supply stems to a game developer, you need to try to organize them in very logical categories. That way the music should work with any one of these playing. It should be, it should be able to exist. So I should be able to play the melody by itself and it works. I should be able to play the percussion by itself and it works. Likewise, I should be able to pair any of these four or more together and they should work. And then obviously I should be able to stack them all together and it should be a cohesive piece of music that works well in the world. That's what we're trying to do here. And that is specifically why for the advanced members, that's why they're going to be tackling the stems because it's a harder job. It just is. And not every game requires this, but that is certainly a skill that you need to develop as a game, uh, a game composer. Um, that's why we're talking about both of these things today. So I can't, the problem is I can't just write a piece of music and then extract the layers because it, it's not the same as writing a piece of music directly intended to be layer based, right? Uh, it's going to have a different result. So I am providing layers at the end of the day. So what kinds of sounds do I want to represent this world? Well, I just went through my contact to start. So I opened up contact seven. And I just started grabbing some libraries that I think would help to get us to the finish line faster. Um, and these are in no particular order. These are just these are just the libraries that I thought, okay, this could have a place in this world. So very quickly, uh, I grabbed a patch from Gravity, which is one of my favorite pads. Looks like this could be a really cool heavenly. And they, it kind of morphs as, as you play it, which is nice. So gravity, that'd be a cool one. Lures, which is this really cool, um, almost medieval or folk kind of music. Maybe Nordic is, is the way to say, like Vikings. And it's a blend of different instruments, of orchestral instruments. And it creates this really interesting droney vibes. like cool little patterns that kind of ebb and flow between the three instruments really well designed uh, a few more i don't need to go through all of these but arcus sequis so these are um these are new libraries from orchestral tools i love orchestral tools i was turned on to them last year and you guys have seen me use orchestral tools products like almost exclusively over the last year ever since i started using metropolis arc series but they also have these two libraries and they have they're actually working on a third one for a string quartet, which I'm really excited about, um, like small ensemble stuff. But these two are called Arcus and Sequis, and they are ambient generation uh, tools, but specifically with orchestral instruments. So it sounds real. It, it's really cool. So here's one of their default patches called Drops of Melancholy. I'm just going to hold one note. Listen. And if I move the mod wheel, that's what you're visually seeing. And of course, you can build chords. All right, isn't that cool? I 
out of the way my camera went. That's dumb. <laughs> Let's fix that. La, da, da. But it's super cool library, Arcus, because you just get to mess around. <laughs> it, it's so inspiring. It, it makes me, um, just gives me a lot of ideas almost instantly that are still orchestral in nature, but have that pad-like quality, which I think is super cool. Another one is Sequis. Very similar, but this one is much more uh, tempo concerned. So I wouldn't naturally have written, like if I was gonna play some piano chords, I wouldn't have thought to add the, the chuggy strings in the background that have a cool delay, but it's just a cool inspiring thing to do. So that could be a really cool palette. There's some other weird ones that I pulled up that I thought might be really cool. Mallet Flux, it combines different mallet instruments like vibraphone, marimba, xylophone, celeste, uh, glockenspiel, and it puts them all together and then throws an, arp, an arpeggiator on top. I mean, who? I, I wouldn't have thought to do that. So you can also do really cool stuff. So obviously you can play around with it. Uh, there's, they have a lot of different patterns in here because they're just arpeggiated MIDI. That's pretty cool. Of course, you could do this manually. That's cool. That's interesting to me because that gives it gives the ambient vibe, a pad, if you will, but it also provides some kind of rhythmic interest. That way it's not just boring, right? I think ambient music gets a really bad rap for just being boring, like a drone in the background. Nobody wants that in their game. So instead, ambient music should always have some kind of dynamic rise and fall, right? I actually really like that patch we just played. Um, and I, like, I was playing an F minor and then an F2. And it is tempo sync, so I actually have to make sure my tempo is what I want. So let me turn off the audio there. I like that it, it goes up and down in volume. It's pretty cool. Let's just put it in there. And let me set my range of my track to be longer. Okay, I don't know why it's stopping. I wonder if my arpeggiator. It doesn't like when I change chords, so let me try it again. 
One, two, hold the cord. That's really relaxing. Sometimes that's all it takes. Now, because I'm not wholly satisfied with that, I, I think it's a good start. Let's go over to the production side. My mixer, I'm going to add a filter. So this is just a, an EQ. One of the quickest ways to change your sound or to edit your sound, to change your sound, is to use an EQ. So an EQ just helps you to, to carve out where frequency-wise you want that sound to shine. So it doesn't really need to be a bass. It really doesn't need to be high. It just needs to kind of live there in the middle. So let's hear it like that. And we can use an analyzer to really see what's happening. There, that fits good. That fits well. Um, now, before I get too far, one of the, the strongest considerations is to make sure it fits with the sound design. So let's just play that first because I think that's going to be an integral sound to our palette here today. And there's a lot of woodwinds happening in the clip. So let's be, just make sure it doesn't interfere. I think it works to some extent. <laughs> There's a lot of sound design happening. Um, you can almost play this game with no music at all and it would probably work, but that's not the goal. Um, and, man, I got a little bit too ahead of myself. I also wanted to share that we have the design doc. Specifically, two things I want to look at. This page, this, this is from the game devs. These are some soundtracks and composers that they really like and they want this track to emulate. So, the, right off the bat, the two that really scream out to me are The Legend of Zelda and Journey, two games I've already referenced, and Gareth Coker, Austin Winery. I actually don't recognize the other... I actually know uh, Wonder Song as well. Um, but some of these other names I don't recognize. And that's okay. I don't think you necessarily need to know all of them. I think in a perfect world, it would be wise to go through and to listen to examples of all of those games and all of those composers to become very familiar. That way you, you understand. But I do... Uh, think that because this game has a lot of journey vibes already and because I do know those composers and their sounds I, I feel like I have a pretty strong guess as to the direction they want to go um, but that is obviously a very important thing to understand from any game dev team um, there's a gameplay clip in here some art um, and then here these are some of the suggested areas that they would love to have music um, so ambient sound reacting to instrument, acoustic space, specific audio for fauna and wildlife biomes. What else we got here? Sorry if, if I blocked your view there. There we go. Now you can see the whole page. Whoops. Um, puzzle ambience with reward, music thematic. So there you go. Some ideas. Back to Cubase we go. So... Uh, I think that we're going to do that well here today. Uh, let's again, let's mute the uh, that thing. And I liked the mallets. Let's make sure we quantize that the way everything fits well with this whole arpeggio thing. And then because recently I've just been really obsessed with working with audio only, uh, I'm also going to make sure that my mod wheel is all the way down right before it starts. 
let's do this. I'd like to take this chunk. I'd like to disable all of my plugins and then render that in place real quick. Let's see if I have that. There we go. Oopsie. Rendering in place just converts the MIDI into audio that we can really work with it. Anytime I work with audio, like ambient stuff, atmospheric material, I think it's really, really smart to bounce it to audio. That way you can have complete control specifically over things like fade ins, fade outs. Um, if you want to do some interesting reversal effects, whatever, you can do all that with the audio. So now I can go in here and I can actually chop specifically to the beat these items. I'm going to extend it slightly so I can do a fade out and I'm going to um, extend it slightly on the front end to give it a little bit of a fade in. And this way I can go back and I can enable the same effect. It actually copies the effect over, which is pretty cool. And if I turn, if I bypass the plugin, it'll actually just turn it off completely and it doesn't use the CPU. And this way I'm not even having to use that track at all. And I'll even go one step further by right clicking and going to, um, oops, wrong menu, my bad. Cubase, forgot, not Pro Tools. Over here, you go to disable selected tracks, and now it'll just kind of sit there, but it's not using any CPU or RAM to load the sample instruments, and I have a lot loaded, so it's good. Good little practice. I personally always change my, uh, my clips, my audio to blue. It's just the color I like to see for bounced audio. And now we have 100% full control over this and we can really make it the volume level we want it to be. And that sounds nice. I like it. Now, of course, there's so much more we can do. Um, but again, I'm really trying to hit the ambient layer, a bass layer, a harmony layer, and I'm sorry, a uh, melody layer and some kind of percussion. So let's just kind of keep going through some of the, the items I have here. There's another one called Kinetic Metals. This one is really fascinating. So these are like pitched metals and you can turn this motion button on and it starts to turn the wheels. my wheel and it, it morphs this whole wheel. Kind of a sound designy bell. mod wheel.
It's a good bass. And it creates this really unsettling, otherworldly vibe. Here we go on the downbeat. Keep going. I like everything but this last one. So these are all eighth notes. Da, 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 da. Nope, sixteenth notes. Da, 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 da. There we go. It's all quantized. Um, it's pretty cool. Okay, so same thing. Let's give it that same treatment of bouncing it in place like this. You can hear that, right? Good. I'm just trying to make sure. <sighs> Pretty cool. Again, you guys can do whatever you want with your score. Uh, and this, this is why it's so fun. Everyone has their own personality and their own writing style. But for me, I love ostinatos. I was actually listening back to some of my old music yesterday. Like some of my earliest soundtracks. And it's really amazing to me how even though at the time I didn't know it was like my style or my compositional signature, but if you listen to just about anything I write, there is some kind of ostinato, like a repeated figure that just keeps going and going, which is like a minimalistic thing. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, yes, value music I have deactivated in addition to bypassing. So yes, I've done that for the CPU. And you can tell over here because the track... Well, it's over here, actually. This track is grayed out. See that? It's kind of faint. It's grayed out because it's deactivated. So, yeah. So, yes, because I did that thing right there. And now I will do exactly what you suggested. Over here, deactivate. Where is it? Disable. That's, that's the term in, in Cubase. Anyway, if it has the little R beside it, that means it has been bounced. It's rendered in place. So, now I have this beautiful... Um, vibey bell thing that I can play around with. So let's do that. First thing is um, it needs some kind of EQ really bad. So let's play around with that to really fit it into its spot. Let's listen to it. Let's look at it. Let's solo it. I think I distorted a razor. All right, let's put it back together. Yeah, Bailey, um, the challenge actually starts on Monday next week. And I'm just giving a head start by showing the process that way when we reveal the challenge next week, we'll have the resources in hand just to show you some of the steps involved. I think this is a good start. It still doesn't have the thud I want, but it's a cool tone. So I think it needs some reverb, specifically a chorus reverb. This is called B2 by 2C 
audio, really cool plugin. It gives space to things. It's gonna basically create a pad. What I don't want is to ruin the hit. Pretty cool. Too much reverb. This way. So far, so good. I'm liking this. Just for kicks and giggles, because this has now basically become a synth, let's also throw up here at the top of the chain. Let's throw on um, RC20 Retro Color, which has become one of my favorite plugins recently because it, it mimics synth colors, like analog synth colors with some wobbles and things. So you gotta be judicious about it, but let's try adding a tiny bit of noise, a tiny bit of wobble. Probably it kind of wobbles, is it? That way it doesn't just stay still, it goes wah, 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 wah. I might actually just use this space instead of B2s. Let me disable B2 for a second. That actually works better. It's not so distant. So let me get rid of B2. That works. Turn it down. I might even get rid of the low end completely. Cause I just kind of like just the after effect. I'll keep in that base as little as possible. I'm going to add other stuff on that low end that's going to help fill it out. But it kind of just it, it exists as this little tail pad thing. I have no idea what we're going with this. But another plug I want to try is called Lo-Fi Glow. It's really cool. It's another, a lot of these are just complete instruments from Contact. Uh, Lo-Fi Glow just has a really cool sound. Yeah, if you haven't used RC20 before, they have a, a free trial and it's really good. That's what sold me on it. I like this plugin because it 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 combines two synths but it detunes them and it adds noise and you know all the traditional things that would make something sound lo-fi which might be really cool on top of this kind of grainy feel anyway not that i'm trying to make, make lo-fi music but to have some kind of like melody it's not really a melody it's like a, a, a hook 
Obviously, it's kind of out of tune, so that's the point. So with that, if we're going to do something like that, it needs to be very, very judicious, like as few notes as possible. I'm going to throw on a stereo delay. These are just some fun, creative experimentation tools. back to that I don't know if I'm sold on that sound some others would be stray light there's no way I can use all these sounds there's no way I've used stray light a lot in trailers recently because it has these cool whooshes And this environment might, might be too colorful and bright to like, it doesn't really need this kind of. It's a little bit dark. So let's say no to stray light, as cool as it is. Far light is vocals. something different. There it is. That's the sound I was looking for with the lo-fi glow. This is the one. So this is a sound paint. It's a free engine just like contact player. Uh, and you can throw just about anything into here. But this is one of the default patches it comes with. And it's the piano, the 1928 Steinway. And they have a bunch of different like effects thrown on them. Uh, and this one is cool because it's called the Drake Piano. Because it has this, uh, you can see the pitch going wild over here. It's actually like frantically going up and down. So it's actually morphing constantly, which is really cool. It has a bunch of effects on it. And it's a free plugin. You can go grab it today. This is created by the creator of uh, 8DO, Trolls, Fullman. This is his new company. I think this gives like this, it gives a piano sound, but it's a little bit synthy. It has this warble effect, which I think is going to work well if we kind of hang out in this C minor zone. Thank you. 
That's pretty cool. So that'll be the start of the B section. Over here, so let me put that in. B section, which is already time-wise. Hold up. Let me make sure my time is showing somewhere up here. Where'd that thing go? Uh, I haven't gotten all of my settings perfected yet within Cubase 12. I've only used it for like a few days. Um, somewhere in here is a button you push and it opens up this menu a little bit more. Cubase is very, very deep. Where is it? Every other little set. It's these little triple dots. And you can expand to show more options. But one of them is it will show you. I don't care about that. Max record time. Dumb. Uh, it's kind of an important feature. So I should really need to find this. No, 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 not my tools. Any Cubase 12 wizards among us? I know down here, like you click these little dots and just more options open up. There it is, found it, boom. It's called secondary time display, so right there. So we're currently at uh, 30 seconds. That's what I was looking for. Anyway, sorry about that. It's actually not the cogwheel on the right, I think. Could it be? Could it be that simple? No, it's not that simple. There's so many menus in this program. Anyway, let's go back to the... It's a nice little... It's kind of a melody. It's like a little phrase. But what the cool thing is of using layers is it, this can just come in at certain moments like the cutscenes when you're not using the flute. Then it goes up to A-flat. We have some advice in the audience. Right click on bars and select seconds. Bars, 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 bars. Like here, or here, here, here. Donde? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured it out. Cool. Yeah, we're good. Actually, I wanted to use quantize anyway. My settings did not save from my last session. That's a bummer. I need to go in and like create a template that I load all my things from. That's a thing. Anyway, thanks. And hi. Hi, by the way. Uh, I'm really liking this sound. This is fun. So I'm thinking the B, B section really starts over here at measure 17. And now I can see my bars, and that's what I was really looking for. Because now everything's quantized to a quarter note with all the little slashes, the grid on the paper, on the screen. All right, let's do this again. We're in C minor. I, wanna I don't want to play it really heavy. Oh, you're talking about right here. Oh, seconds, bars. That's what you mean. Oh, cool. I didn't even know that was a thing. I'm learning more things about Cubase every day. It's pretty wild. Speaking of which, ah, I need to get rid of something. Hold on a second. See, I have key commands for Streamlabs OBS that are conflicting with, um, there we go. See, <laughs> like every time I push the buttons, it's moving my, my camera. Um, so I need to get rid of whatever the heck happens when I do 
that. Okay, let me fix that. I'm not 100% healed from last week. But this is a start. So something's happened when I push control three. That needs fixing. Let's find it. How do I find you? Typically right after you do the thing. Oh, it adds a marker. That's weird. That's dumb. Let me get rid of it. Let me zap it. There it is. Oh, it's literally called set marker. Okay, that's dumb. I'm sure that's helpful for somebody out there. I do not want that key command because that conflicts with my streaming software. So that's what's happening. I'm like, why are there so many markers on my screen? That's why. Again, these are the things that typically you can solve once in your DAW and then you're good. As long as you save a template and like save it as your default. And you're good to go. Uh, this is why I don't like to update software very often because you have to go through this awful process. And now it should all be saved and good to go with no issues. And now my timeline should stay. <laughs> like a lot of things were changing. That was really annoying. Okay, back to the show. Yay, you can see me and I can play the, play the Drake piano. Awesome, here we go. Uh oh, there we go. Ready to go. C minor, here we go. A flat. C minor. Back to A flat. That'll be the B section right there. Let's clean up some of those. Da, 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 da. But I like that being off the beat. Ba, ba, like syncopated. That's pretty cool. And it does remind me that uh, I now need to double, let me clean this up real quick, this um, mallet flux thing that I created just needs to be doubled over this way. This is also the beauty of using audio is you can just double things and then just make sure that I use the crossfade tool right here between them. Uh, what's the button X and that'll do that. And I can uh, create a little cross uh, fade in and then a little fade out over here and make it, you know, extend it a little bit beyond the bar. That should work perfectly as a loop. Let's check out that second half now. See how that feels. Over here, the A flat section. Sounds like this got off. It was off, see? My MIDI got off here. Which is, it's an easy fix. Looks like I was off by like a 16th note. No bother. I'll just go over here and we'll move that piece of audio. Uh, right there. And just kind of caress around it. Like that. It's like video editing. You just, you know, clip a little bit out. That was way too loud. 
It's very excited about that G chord. Yeah. Keep it, keep it chill. Excellent. I think we're off to a good start. I don't like that one. So. I like that because it's an F minor chord. It's unexpected. So let's actually make a melody out of this, right? What's that? Keep it in the F minor. No, I'm getting very strong um, Hyperlight Drifter vibes. I don't know why that's the direction I feel like taking, but... Go back to that first idea. So here's another trick I want to use. I wasn't even planning to do this. And if it's a complete fill, uh, I'll just move on. Uh, but here, uh, Cubase can also audio transpose on the fly, which is so cool. And uh, in, in Cubase 12, I haven't used it yet, but it can convert audio to MIDI polyphonically, supposedly. I haven't tried it, but it's a new thing. Uh, but just a click of a button without having to go through like Pro Tools whole audio algorithm thingy, um, which is Elastic Audio, which is still cool. It's, it's just the slower way. It's the old way of doing it. Uh, Cubase can now very intelligently using AI just warp stuff and it sounds really good. So in this case, my uh, mallet is still stuck on B flat, and now I want to go to A flat. So it needs to go down, theoretically, uh, two semitones. So all I have to do is go over here and literally right there, transpose. Just select the thing I want to change. So let's fix it, let's, uh, chop it up first. So it's two bars worth, right? First and foremost, let me turn my quantize bar here. Boom. So this chunk needs to transpose. So all I have to do is go to transpose. I think it's just a half step. So just push the number one and it'll automatically do it. That's so cool. Nah. So let's actually find it. Okay, so it, negative two because it needs to go from I said it right the first time. I need to go from B flat to A flat, so that's minus two. And that's so cool. And you can only do this with audio. I mean, of course you can do it with MIDI, but eh, I don't know. I just like working with audio. It's permanent. Here we go. So freaking cool. And then, because we're going back to C minor, just do this little... Come on, Whoop. do my little X and it's ready. Yeah, Mallet Flux is its own library. It's, it's part of complete, um, complete 12, 13, 14, whatever the heck number we are on these days with uh, contact native instruments. There it is. Thank you. 
It's just a tighter crossfade. So here again, we, we need to just make this one minus two. That is the most useful feature ever. I love it. So now we need to go down another half step. So minus three. Am I doing that right in my head? Am I going the wrong direction? As long as I can pick the right number, it'll work. So we're on B, B flat. B flat, A flat. It should be negative three, because that's G. Doesn't feel right. There it is. All right, found it. Just make it a five for whatever reason. I don't even care to analyze why that is. I just want to move on with my life and use the magic of Cubase. So it is, it is complete 14. Jeez, I bought complete for the first time back in complete eight. It was like 10 years ago. Okay, somebody asked, I think it was Will. I was not ignoring you, I just was really in the zone. Uh, I'd like to, he wanted to ask, he was asking to hear this with the gameplay. It actually works better without the mallets. There's too much pitch information. Yes, that is sound paint you hear. So this is also the beauty of layers. You know, you give the dev team a bunch of layers and they can decide how to pair them together. Um, let's keep going. So this is piano colors. I've never used it. But it attaches to your tempo. It's pretty cool. It's an arpeggiator of piano.
It's a really cool sounding piano. Oh my god. Whoa. Whoa. It's not bass. Take the noise off, the pedal noises. Get in there, guys. Now, A flat. Back to C minor. Back to A flat. And a G suspended. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. Like really good piano sound. Wow. I was not expecting that. And sometimes to get a bigger than life sound, you have to use production. It's just part of it. A, a live piano will not sound like that. This is actually a piano mixed with uh, some mallets, apparently. And I'm sure somewhere under the hood is, I mean, look at all these layers and the global, like, it's EQ'd out of whack, right? It has a saturation, a compressor, has these different knobs. So it has clearly been processed to, so that this low end is just beefy. It's like just the sub from the, the low piano notes. Really cool. So let me quantize that and and disable this plugin before it eats my lunch. And we can do more fun stuff with it when it's processed. So let's let's print it. Never understood that that term. People in the music industry love to say print the audio, like you're printing a piece of paper. <laughs> it just means like make it permanent. Commit it is another word people use. Commit it to audio. Mm -hmm. I'm really loving that um, that chord progression. It's simple, but it's it's dark, which actually really works because like the chord structure is dark because they're all minor chords mostly. It's C minor, A flat, major, F minor, right? It's a one six four. But what's interesting is even though the chords are darker because I have these these high floating sounds mixed with this low earthy sounds it and like the wood of the marimbas it it kind of gives this forest mystical vibe and of course the flute sounds from the sound design take care of so much of that too so now we can visually see the piano so let me disable that plugin free up some space now we can play around with the EQ. I typically only play with the EQ once it's printed to audio because it, it I can work with the actual sound. So this is obviously super bassy and it's probably, if, if you're using a subwoofer right now, it's probably like destroying your ears because you see all that information below 20. So I was taught in audio school, you should always roll off 20 and below because that is like, there's just bad frequencies that take up space 
and no one can hear them. And if you can hear them, you're on a subwoofer. And even then, you don't want to like destroy the subs or, or make such a, a loud, like you want to break the subs basically or like overcrowd the music with low sub. So you, you just roll off around 20, you're safe. Same thing, anything pretty much above 20K is almost inaudible anyway and it just takes up space. Sometimes you need it, but it's not too common. You see how much space is being wasted. <laughs> there we go. Sounds good. It's just so meaty, and I like that it's a piano and not a sub, like a um, a sub bass or a um, electric bass, a synth bass. I actually like that it's a piano because it still has that thud. A slight pop every time it hits. That, that little that little rise is is the timbre, the tone of the instrument. Uh, okay, Jay is asking about can we visually see with Pro-Q what's happening over time? Yes, because if you watch it, only if you turn the analyzer on. So watch, if I turn the analyzer, I can do pre-EQ. So this is what I did. This is what it looks like before I shaped it. And you can do post-EQ. This is what it is now. Just for the track it's on, which is the piano. I just turn it off because the analyzers suck up all kinds of CPU and you don't need to leave them all on, just the one you're actively using. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Let's get some more fun colors in here and then we'll start dividing them up into stems. Gosh, this sounds like Journey. Or the Mandalorian. simple that tune is out quite cool funny my whole thing is off here oops probably when I was shifting the grid this needs more love here Cool. What else we got? Just like a normal piano. Mm 
And then I, I grabbed a bunch of perk, some ethnic perk. one idea just kind of some ethnic uh, damage armageddon ensemble also grabs a djembe ensemble which you can't see at the moment there we go it's from sign this is uh orchestral tools have a lot of their stiffs and their their miking is so clean i love that Free library, by the way. Um, if anyone does not have the sign player, it's completely free, just like sound paint. And Orchestral Tools has all of these, have eight, nine libraries that are completely free. A string ensemble, percussion, big band horns, church organ, acoustic guitars, more drums and percussion, a felt piano, ukulele, and a jazz flute. And they are all phenomenal. Go grab them all right this second. They are incredible. Orchestral Tools is on top of their game. Mm -hmm. Which makes me want to try some of these, actually. Let's do this. Let's grab Sign. They're also very good efficiency loaders, like Contact. So over here, the Free String Ensemble. Let's just see what that sounds like. Sounds really good. I mean, doesn't take much. I feel like strings would really go well here. Come on now, find me a better string patch that's free. Like I'm fine using that and I have lots of paid strings. It's, it's, it's what it is, man. Ladies, you're not all men. Some of you are ladies. And I appreciate that. I, I am actually very proud of that fact. We have very strong representation of the female composer crowd, which is incredible. Makes my heart very happy. My first, my first composer job was assisting 
Panka Kuniva, who is one of the premier women composers in the world, and I absolutely love that. Now let's doctor it up by adding, so this is a strings ensemble. Let's, it doesn't really need much, but I'd like to throw B2 on that because it's just gonna add a lot of space. Oh, how does the Skyrim theme go? It's not like Skyrim strings, which is amazing. So good, like Shout out to all the Star Fox 64 fans for life. All right, moving on. <laughs> that, that took a quite a detour, but. Ooh, it just kind of floats. Turn it down to get out of the way.
inappropriate, but I love it. If there, if there was a battle in this game, there's not. Digging that Udu. It's horribly too loud just because of the miking. So here's a moment where going through the mixer, if they even have it. I don't think they have multiple mic positions on these free ones. That's okay. We'll just have to deal with it in our EQ. Um, so let's go over here to the EQ and let's just try to shape this a little bit. Some of that energy in there, and then we'll we'll uh, talk through exporting the stems. I think we're close. This is not a one. This is a very short loop. Actually, it's a minute long. I didn't even realize that, huh? I guess we did it. Now, in an ideal world, I would go through and write a B theme as well, but just we don't need that today with this whole demo. And I want to make sure I have time to show you guys um, what I'm doing. But that's okay. We'll just make that the loop. That's a good loop. It's a good one minute loop. Loop. Um, one of the questions earlier was, okay, Stephen, how do I make an effective loop like that? Well, so glad you asked. Making a loop is all about making sure the last measure leads well into the first measure. That's really it. So when you, there's a lot of ways you could approach that. Uh, in general, I like to think of it from a music theory perspective of choosing my chords. So if I know that I started my piece of music on a C minor chord, which is right here, then my last chord should either be a C minor, because it's the same and it'll mesh well, or I need to choose a chord that will lead well to a C minor. So in music theory, the most common example in all of the history of music is a five chord. So in the key of C minor, the five chord is a G major. And that's exactly what I chose to do right here. G chord one. It really is that simple. There are other chords I could have chosen. Um, some less common, but still equally valid chords would be maybe a, a minor four chord, which would be an F minor. I could have done an A flat major, which is a six chord. A seven would have worked too. A flat seven would have worked, which would be a B flat going to the C. Uh, you can't hear that. Like that. Flat seven, one, five, one, six, seven, one, four, one. Right? Any of those would work really well. The other chords in this scale would not work super well. So like going from a two to a one could work. It's just not as effective. It doesn't feel like the final moment. Not that it has to, but three, eh, three to one. It's just not as effective. Uh, what are the other numbers? I mean, that's it, right? We did one, four, five, six, seven. So you actually have five choices. 
You could do minor five or major five. In my case, um, I added a seventh note to the G in the melody. So that's just basic music theory of how you lead to the next section. Uh, and that's what I used to create the loop. Um, sonically, production-wise, I also made sure that my phrases more or less came to a close. So this melody thingy in this p synth piano, I made sure that uh, if you kind of look at the contour here, it's nothing too fancy, but I go down, down, up, down, 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 up, down. Did you catch that? I didn't even know that. I didn't even know I was doing that, but I just knew it felt right to do that. Um, so by down, I mean the notes go down, they descend. That's down, that's down, then up. Question, answer, 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 question, answer, and then back to the beginning. So it's just a basic principle of writing music is to try to ask more questions than give answers. And that way it kind of keeps it interesting. Um, and these are all subtle things that you just kind of pick up with experience, but uh, creating a loop is all about creating a piece of music that never feels like it needs to end. And there we go. And the most effective loops have a tendency to use multiple themes. So this whole section I would call an A section. And then in most cases, I wouldn't deliver it like that. I would write another theme, which would be of equal length. And this would be a two minute piece of music. And this would be a B section of a contrasting style. So instead of like this mallet thing being like the groove in the background, I'd probably use something a lot more chill, like a cello solo or whatever. Anything that's just a different sound that still feels like the same instrumentation, but different sound, different vibes. And that way when I loop, it would then go back to this A section. Um, but you know, for our purposes today, it doesn't have to be longer than a minute, so it's not gonna be. So now let's finalize the process uh, by adding some of this percussion. That's really all I want, just something chill to hold it together. Add these little hits in the between just to kind of keep it from being too repetitive. So we always have the da, da. So the syncopated beat uh, that repeats the whole time. Um, but these little hits kind of come and go. This needs a, just a tad of some kind of reverb. It's just too dry. Actually, let me find a cave or something similar to a cave. I think we have a cave in here. A canyon. Cave. We actually have a cave. I'll just turn it down a lot. It just makes it feel like we're in the actual space, you know? Thank you. 
like that. that. That groove. It pairs well with the Udu. It's a djembe ensemble. Very ethnic. Give it some space. See you, Marie. Alright, I like the djembe doing that. You want to kind of space it out so it's not so over the top. So, an effort to make this more interesting, I'm going to pull out the percussion on the off measures. So you can see what I'm doing down here. I want it to only line up with um, those big beats. Oh, cool. And this is just a drum layer that, that can be used or not. Doesn't really matter. Let me continue with my chopping here. Just going through and get rid of all of the measures that, that have nothing to do with lining up with the djembe. That's the goal. Otherwise, it's just too much percussion. And it's not super usable. So here's what it sounds like together. I actually don't like these in betweens. Interesting. Ta 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 boom. It just it, it it's too much energy when the energy needs to be coming from other things. It's just taking up too much space. Less percussion is always better. In most cases. <laughs> Let's record some shaker. Shall we? Let's just see what happens. Good idea, bad idea, horrible idea to be determined.
All right, just an idea. Let's see if that works at all. And if not, we'll kill it. Yeah, this is a thicker shaker. Um, Pretty cool. There we go. Nice little touch. This gives us some like KV vibes without going over the top. And then the last thing I want to add for today, and then we'll I'll be done. Let me get rid of the piano, get rid of ash light. Um, Armageddon Ensemble still might fit. Like that. The big beats.
I like it. Let's do it. Eight of those coming right up. Very relaxing. Very simple. It's supposed to be simple. Ten tick a ten ten. Wow, those are thirty second notes. It's because of our slow tempo. Rah. It's a little hard to quantize. Ten tick a ten ten. Maybe they are sixteenth notes, it's just way off. Nope, it's it's thirty seconds. That stinks. <laughs> stinks having to quantize or having to copy and paste this stuff but whatever too late for that vibraphone i mean it the vibes in the the uh, marimba thing the mallet flux i have one more instrument i want to add to give some more vibes different kind of vibes not vibraphone but vibes What's muted? Yeah, the vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, last little thing, then we'll call it a day, because, yeah, I call this the horror flute. One day I'll sample it. All you peoples to have. But until then, it's mine. All right, this is one of my favorite instruments. It's a wooden bamboo flute, which I have zero clue how to play, which is fine. That's what makes it more fun. <sighs> Currently very dusty. I've used this thing religiously on Dark Dice. I use it for like wind sound effects. And it's really cool for moments like this. So let me uh, mute this. Monitoring, input monitoring. Let's play some flute. And it'd be way more fun once I put B2 on it. So let me do that. B2. You too can with B2. Two, two. All right. Thank you. 
<laughs> Pardon me. B2 is a chorused reverb. It's this beautiful, beautiful, it's like Valhalla Shimmer, but somehow different. I just don't know how to explain it. I don't get all the knobs, but it's just amazing. Go look at it. Gareth Coker, the very person we're trying to emulate here, swears by it, so it's good enough for me. I understood some of those words. Let's talk about layers and let's export some stuff. So the first thing, first things first, let's, so we didn't use all this stuff, just get rid of it. First thing I want to do is export all of my audio, which is what my Kickstarter folks will be doing. So once you've gotten all your stuff ready, I didn't even bounce everything, but whatever, I bounced some things. What you do? at least in Cubase, you set your marker. So I have everything set for right here. I am going to extend my marker ever so slightly just to kind of account for the reverb tail and that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm going to go to bounce. Oh, goodness gracious. Make sure my grid is on. Everything looks good except for this part. It does not look good. Let's do 19. 1.1.0, there we go. Okay, now this beautiful menu comes up. And this is where we need to figure out what we're gonna export. So I'm gonna do bit depth of 24 bit, sample rate 48 kilohertz. That's the industry standard right there. You can always go higher, but there's no purpose in as far as delivery goes, because that's the final. So this is gonna be my stereo out track right here. Single stereo out, that is what I'm exporting. Um, I'm going to spare us the time of going through a real-time export and just export it. Let's give it a second. I hope this video has been helpful for you guys. There we go. I hope this video has been helpful for you guys. Um, this final stage is I'm going to export the single track, which is what Kickstarter folks are gonna do. And then I'm going to export the stems, so every track individually. And then we're going to recombine them so that we can have grouped stems. And that way, you can deliver that to the game developer, in our case, to VGMA. And it gives us the ability to um, mix them and play around with them and play around with what does it sound like if we only use some stems and not all of them. 
And in some cases, according to the game states, like the events that happen in the game, um, let's say like a battle starts and all of a sudden, you know, the percussion comes in. Or in our case, because it's like a puzzle adventure game, um, when you solve a puzzle, maybe like the big strings come in or something. And it just gives the game devs a lot more to work with and a lot more bang for their buck. It's an incredible way to write music for video games. Uh, we're about 80% exported. And thanks, guys. Uh, this has been really fun. I hope you'll join us in two weeks as we have a listening party through as many as we can get through um, of all the submissions. I don't anticipate we're going to have like dozens and dozens, but I think we're going to have a, a solid amount to try and, and put to picture and, and play around with it, especially the folks who are doing stems. That's going to be really fun to play around with. Um, okay, so I've exported just that stereo, and now the next step is to do the same bounce. I have not figured this out in, in my new version of Cubase yet, but it, it, I bet it's a key command thing. It keeps like snapping to the length of my video instead of my markers, which is dumb, but whatever. I can solve that later. In the uh, box here, Instead of single, those of you using stems are going to go to multiple. Uh, Logic has a similar interface here. What you're going to do is you're going to bounce out everything that, in my case, is blue. So I'm going to hit mallet flux, kinetic metals, piano colors, shaker, horror flute, and then even inside of my instrument. I don't want a stereo out track. I want everything that's not grayed out, essentially. Um, so for me, that's going to be the piano sound pay damage. It's all of these, right? So it's typically everything. So those are all the instruments I'm going to be exporting. And then we're going to do some recombining in a separate session to keep it all clean and beautiful. Okie dokie. Um, and then what I, I like to do is go over here to my naming. And I like to type in stem. And then when you click outside that box, it'll show you a preview of what the files are gonna look like. So stem underscore name of track, which is super helpful. That way I know that everything is a stem. So instead of just exporting this to the normal location, I'm actually gonna put this in a separate folder over here. I'm going to create a new folder, I'm just gonna call it stems version one, because this whole thing is version one. And then right here, boom, save it in there. And now, there we go. Now I can do the naming convention like that. Okie dokie. And then I'm going to hit export. Give it a minute because what it's doing is it's actually exporting every individual piece of audio. But Cubase seems to do this a heck of a lot faster than most other DAWs. Um, I, I love Pro Tools, but Pro Tools has the unfortunate situation where you actually have to route every individual track to a stem. Um, it's a bit of a, a bit of a hassle. So I'm going to show you how I do this very quickly inside Audacity, which is a free DAW, which every one of you can use on Mac or PC. I use it for really quick things. Um, I'm just going to show you my process. It's not, it's not the way that you have to do it, but I find it very quick whenever I'm dealing with stems in particular, layers in particular. So I hope this is helpful. We're about 50% done. Uh, and Arfo asks, is 24 bits depth standard? I always thought it was 32 because that's what I see on samples. Um, 24 bit 48 kilohertz is the industry standard. It's what almost everyone asks for, uh, video game developers included. The game developers actually typically want smaller files, not larger files. So they may even ask you to convert it to an OGG file, an OGG file, or sometimes a FLAC, maybe for a soundtrack, whatever. There's just different files um, to try to keep the, you know, an uncompressed small file. Wave is the best because it's the initial original source file, and you can always crush it smaller than that. Um, when I'm personally writing music, I do write at 96 kilohertz, 32 bit float, which is significantly more headroom and it's just a better sounding file. Um, I don't do that for streams because it would just blow up my machine. There's just too much going on with the camera and live stream and everything. But um, that's why I write with you guys. I always do 48K 
24 bit, but that's also the, the final delivery. Not a big deal, but whenever I deliver to clients, I will even take my 96 K 32 bit float and I will crush it down in half to 48 K 24 bit. Okay. So now that this part is done, this is the good news is we can just be done with Cubase. Da, 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 da. Now what I'm going to do is if you will give me a short two minute break, I'm going to open up a fresh DAW session of Pro Tools. I'm going to throw all of those. No, I'm not. Just kidding. Don't get mad at me yet. Hold on. That was a lie. That was a lie. Da, 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 da. I can't do that yet. I'm going to show you. I was going to show you what to do in Audacity. That's the nice thing to do. So don't run away yet. Hold on. I don't usually use Audacity with you peoples, but that's okay. All right. So let me show you what's happening over here. So I have a fresh, just opened up Audacity over here, free software. It's an audio editor. And now I have my folder of stems. Everything says stem underscore name of instrument, which is fantastic. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna group these things together. The groups I'd like to have, do, do, do. I'd like to have ambience, melody, bass, and percussion. That's basically it. Let's get the percussion out of the way because that's the easiest one to find. I would even call, I'd call horror flute percussion because it's kind of part of that, that more intense layer. So let's throw all of them in at the same time. And there they are, beautifully all stacked and everything. And then I'm going to always double check that my sample rate down here, my project rate is 48,000. That's what it should be because we put it in here like this. So all I'm gonna do is go to file, export, and let's do export as wave. Now the only problem if you do the export as wave is the default setting is 16 bit and that's not what we want. So you're gonna have to go to other uncompressed files and then you can actually manually set it to 24 bit wave and it will stay at the project rate, which is 48. So that's what we want, 48K, 24 bit. And we're just gonna call this whole thing, oops, I have to find my folder. Sorry, I have 5,000 million bajillion folders on my, on my computer across my six drives. So just, just wait, okay, just calm down. Um, there it is, there it is, there it is. So those are the stems, but we, I'm gonna get another folder. Combine stems, because this is truly the stems that we want. So this is gonna be called stem underscore percussion. Boom, it's super quick. Boom, it's already, it's already done, okay? Then I'll just kind of X out all of those, grab my, my doodad again, and I'm actually going to um, delete these. I don't need them anymore. And just so I can visually see everything better. Here we go. So now the next layer I want to make the melody, the clear melody winner. I don't even know if you can hear this. Yeah. That's kind of the melody of the day, right? So this guy is already done. He's already ready because he's his own thing. So I'm just going to call that melody. Next, um, the bass is effectively this guy, so he can just be done. That's the bass. And if you remember, it was this track. Like that. Okay. And then I would consider the rest of these to be atmosphere. So here's the connect metals. It's that bell-like thing. This is the vibes and then strings. So I would consider all three of those collectively to be ambience. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna hit my control E, which is export. Make sure we're on 24 bit and then just call this bad boy. Not that, stem uh, ambience. So now we have four beautiful condensed stems. 
right there. Boom. There's everything. And I'm just going to put them all right here. And now we're basically done. So if you guys give me a second, uh, give me about two minutes, I'm going to open up a session of Pro Tools and throw these in there um, with the video. Just that way we can play around with what a game developer would experience. So don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, everybody, to the live composing show here at Video Game Music Alliance. We just had a really fun stream where I got to write some ambient music, just a one-minute loop for AVN as part of our VGM challenge, which launches next week on Monday, and all of our pro members inside VGMA are going to have one week to compose a track. And if you remember, the goal for Kickstarter members, which are our beginners, their goal is simply to write a piece of music that fits the scene, that fits fits the game as a stereo wave file, a 48 kilohertz, 24-bit wave file. And we will have a listening party in two weeks here at the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard, um, as we get to test it to picture and have some fun with that. But for our Launchpad and Accelerator members, those are the more advanced folks who have walked through some of our... Um, come on, camera, there we go. Uh, who have walked through our courses and they've learned quite a bit already about music production, composition, technology, and business. These are the folks who are going to additionally create layers and export those as stems, WAV files, and then we will throw them all in and test them out just to see how they're doing um, and how it pairs to the game. And I'm excited even just to hear some feedback from the game team, and that's what we're doing. We are recreating a real-life situation where um, game composers within our community have the opportunity to actually work with a game developer and get real feedback. And that's going to be a really fun experience. And we are definitely inviting them, the game team to uh, be a part of that stream as well. So don't miss that. So what I've done is I opened up a fresh pro tools session and inside here, after I woke up the hamster who apparently was just waiting around um, so I could turn on the video engine. Um, what I've done is I've imported those four stems, which is ambience, bass, melody, and percussion into uh, the engine here. And now what should happen, should play beautifully just like that. So let's check it out. Let's actually just play around. I'm gonna play around with the mixer over here. And just so we don't have to keep switching screens, I'm gonna play directly right here with the mixer. I'm gonna just fade stuff in and out just to test it out to see if this actually works. And then of course, we'll throw in the real game audio as well to see if it ultimately uh, does the job there. So here we go. Ambience. Oh my gosh. Did you hear that, guys? That's crazy. Did you hear that? The flute in the game. This was total subconscious. I did not even realize this. The notes. I don't have perfect pitch, I promise. Um, and one of our audience members, Marie, does. Or is it Ju? I think one of, it, one of them has actual perfect pitch. Um, the notes that the flute plays were... E, E flat, I'm sorry, G, E flat, C, which is a C minor chord, and it landed exactly as the C minor chord played. So that's just crazy. I, didn't, I never even took the time to figure out what the notes were. So pro, pro tip for anyone taking this challenge, uh, C minor and A flat major, and I would also assume E flat major, maybe D flat major. These are all good keys to try to write uh, for this game because the, those pitches are like embedded into the game and that's what your character is constantly doing. So that's wild. Crazy. Okay. Anyway, 
And here's the moment. I'll find it again. That was just a funny moment. Did not expect to happen. play around with all of them working by themselves. Well, the percussion by itself actually works just as well as anything else. So mission accomplished. just one more thought for you guys. Another reason that I chose to export these in a separate DAW, put them into Pro Tools, is because this is one of the, the best possible ways to test our loops to make sure they work, to make sure the the stems work well with each other and of course all together. And we can play with, around with the different volume levels and we're, not, we're no longer thinking about composition, we're just thinking about the production. How do these things actually work together? Um, so yes, the audio track here, this is the actual game audio, uh, the sound design. And I was really impressed and surprised <clears throat> at how well the percussion looped. Or not looped, but um, at how well it actually filled that space. And that's why I decided to put the horror flute in with the percussion layer. That way it's not just the hits, but it's like these little, you know, flute moments in between, which obviously works well with the flute uh, vibe happening on screen. Um, another thing that's really nice about using Pro Tools or any other DOW, a fresh session, is I was able to use my grid up here to snap a loop immediately onto the bar without even having to think about reverb tail, without having to think about anything. Um, because if you remember, inside Cubase, I exported all the way to bar 18. So I actually exported four extra beats that weren't necessary, but what that did is it captured the reverb tail. And so as soon as I throw these stems right here on bar 17, because if you remember, if I were to take this, it's actually longer than that, right? The real track is longer, see? But by chopping it right there, because the reverb tail is already kind of baked into the track, it loops very well. And if I, you know, put everything back, you can really hear it. Da, 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 da. Back to zero. And the other thing to consider is music in games is usually turned down a little bit. It's not mastered, right? So when we 
produce a piece of music from our DAW, typically we, we keep it really hot. We keep it really close to unity, usually around negative 0.3 dB. So this is another way to really test out to make sure, okay, cool. If I, if I take these layers like negative 10, negative 15 dB, does it still work? Because this is how it would really be mixed in the game, right about here. It feels really good. It's, it's background music, right? It's not supposed to be the main event, but it, it has a very nice vibe to it. So this is just a, a, another suggestion. It's a way that you can test it out. And this is how I'm gonna be testing out your tracks in two weeks at our listening party. I'm going to take all of your wave stem files, throw them into Pro Tools just like this, organize it by each person, but that way we can actually play back and, and test the layers and make sure these things actually fit um, and it'll be really obvious in that moment whether or not, you know, maybe the percussion's way too loud or way too hot. Maybe you're using some timbres or some tones that really clash with the picture. Or maybe there's, maybe if you do choose to use flutes, they're clashing with the flutes or maybe the pitches are off or something, right? It's going to become really obvious when you can audition it for yourself. Um, and the way that I typically do this in real life Sometimes I'll use Pro Tools, but in real life, I typically use the game engine, like Unity, right? Um, currently working on a game. In fact, I can finally talk about it as of today. Yay. Uh, if you didn't see um, Aethermancer, it is the sequel to Monster Sanctuary with Moi Rai Games. They just released this morning the, their announcement trailer. I got to work on the trailer last week, which was super fun. Uh, I can talk about it now. So that game, uh, I'm doing music and sound, and so... I'm literally working inside the Unity game engine where I throw all the files in there, I attach the assets and I plug it in um, to the game, the levels, characters, whatever. Um, and so I literally have my Xbox, Xbox controller in my hand I'm playing the game and I can directly test if everything works exactly as I need to. And so what I'll sometimes do is I'll have Cubase open, I'll have my session open on one screen, I'll have Unity open on the other screen and I'm playing, playing, playing and then I'm like, oops, that track needs to be tweaked. So I'll, I have it open, so I just tweak it, export it, throw it in, and that's the that's the real way. Like that's like the the most direct possible way. Now, if you don't have the game engine that the um, devs are using, for example, another game I'm working on later this year that will be announced, I guess, later this year, um, is in Unreal, and I don't have the Unreal files. I'm going to ask for them because I'd love to have my hands on to quickly test. It's just faster instead of going back and forth with the game dev team. But if you don't have that luxury, then this is what you do. You just, you create your own unity, essentially. That's what I'm doing right now, is I'm testing it out to make sure it all feels right. And even though I'm not actively playing the game, it's one way of doing it. Um, and uh, one, one more suggestion is if you actually have the, the build of the game, like those of you inside VGMA are going to have next week, you will have access to this AVN game. So when you download it and play it, um, I would highly suggest you open up your DAW session at the same time, play your music, create your loop bar, just like this, right? And then literally play the game. Have your controller in hand and just walk around, play the game, and you're going to either get really tired of your music really fast, and therefore you know it needs tweaking, or if you're like, it's been five minutes, 10 minutes, and like this one minute, two minute loop is still going, and you're like, it feels right, then you know you've you've done a good job. Um, and I'm, I'm confident in this track today. I feel like I did a good job with it. I think I hit the, the parameters. Uh, and again, it's not the end all be all answer, it's just my answer. And so I encourage you guys as you're tackling this challenge to, you know, do you, uh, have fun with it and be creative. So this was super fun. Thank you guys for the fun experience. I'm gonna play out today with the video and the Pro Tools session. And I'm just gonna, like I was just doing a few minutes ago, I'm just gonna kind of fade it in and out, have fun with that um, for a couple minutes and we'll be out of here. So thank you guys. Very strong stream today. Lots of viewers, like a lot of viewers today, like triple I'm used to. <laughs> so thank you for everyone that came out of the Woodworks for this fun stream today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye bye Here is Avian, my take on ambient music for Avian.